not for any reason ever share your private keys, passphrases, passwords, or click suspicious links. Everyone all the time is trying to steal your stuff, so go slow and be careful. There's no point making all this money just to give it to a thief. All right. Let's get to the basics. So today's classroom session, as you guys know, so Tuesdays and Thursdays is office hours, which we used to do on Monday morning where we just answer questions. That used to actually be the AICI. So listen, everybody that just wants the best free stuff ever, um, this is what people were paying for with AICI, just so you know. If you were purchasing AICI, that membership, you were getting this. You were getting two days a week of uh, office hours, basically. And now this is free. So one, two, free. That is right. Brian nails it. So everybody here – so for people that are like, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't afford it, I get it. Trust me, I get it. When you look at consumer numbers, you look at the fact that – um savings are gone gone um right now at this point if you look at savings if you look at debt if you look at debt service both at the personal and private level and at the government level the average american is worse off than during the great depression now you again i'm not going to get into a big job uh, labor market discussion but anytime the bs sorry the bls puts out numbers and every single month they come back and they and they redo the numbers. They go, oh, yeah, we were wrong by like 100,000 jobs. They've been wrong. And they, seven months in a row, they've been putting out bullshit numbers. And this is by their own admission. This isn't Nick talking. This is the BLS editing their numbers after the fact. Oh, my bad, my bad. Those numbers are actually way less. We said 200,000. There's really 100,000 jobs. So I don't know if it's by design, if it's to manufacture some kind of social discourse or whatever, or it's just stupidity and a function of bad data collection. Um, but anyway, the American, the average American is worse off. So – if you find yourself in the in the category of average American that's worse off with less savings, with less um, money to spend, uh, getting beat up at the pump, get get an electric car, um, getting beat up uh, with um, personal debt, getting beat up with uh, predatory debt, getting beat up with school debt, and all these kind of things. Don't worry, because office hours is free. You don't have to pay anything for it. Woo woo. Um, for those of you curious, we do have – let's see. We have uh, 391 of 1,000 digital – why you say that? because we're um, maxing it out at 1,000 um, digital investors. We're maxing it out at uh, 100 digital private clients. That is it. That is all. That's about as much as Brandon and I can manage. So that's what we're doing. Um, we have other people on the team, but they're on the development side. They ain't going to be in front of no camera. They're going to be behind that keyboard, clicking, coding. Um, and yes, we actually write smart contracts. We actually look at them. 
and read them. So for those of you that are catching us and, and you're in the chats every now and then and you're like, you guys are making stuff up. You guys are making weird claims. The beauty of crypto, the whole reason we're here, the beauty of smart contracts is mathematical integrity. You don't need to trust anyone. Smart contracts are not that complicated. It's not like you'll look at it first glance and get it. But in two or three hours, you can basically figure out smart contracts and you can go and look at call functions and things like that. You can understand what you're clicking and you can, I mean, you won't be ready to go audit smart contracts, crap like that, but like, this is all math, bro. And it's not even calculus. It's just like high school algebra. So man, I urge you, all of you don't argue against math. Just go and learn it. It's so much easier. Um, okay, good. All right. Uh, question. Do you know if twin protocol will use hypercycle for queries of twins for some use case? I know that the entire singularity net ecosystem is leveraging other members of the entire singularity net um, ecosystem. Um, I don't, mm, there are some connections I can't talk about, but yes, there's a lot of um, internal groups working with other groups. There's a lot of stuff, but I can't speak for those teams. They, those teams have to, their core kind of executives, they need to come out and say things publicly and things like that. So I can't, I can't talk out of school. Um, I can tell you this with certainty, everybody in the hypercycle community that has one node, five nodes, 500 nodes, 4,091 nodes, everybody will be able to participate when the ecosystem goes live for tilling and then eventually for compute. No one gets to stay on the sidelines if they don't want to. No one's going to be relegated to the to the timeout box while some other secret group gets to do secret shit that none of you – that's not how it works, man. The whole idea of the ecosystem is to spread to, – to geographically spread nodes out all over the world to create a very safe, very, very difficult surface to attack. A widespread net – of nodes all over the world that can communicate in real time. That's the whole idea, bro. So no one's going to be left behind. So don't worry if you don't own a master node or if you just, just we got to stop all that. That's just all, what is that? What do, what do rednecky people, that's thinking, thinking right there. Nobody will be left behind. Everybody will be able to participate. That's why they're building hyper peachy. That's why they're building hyper pools. That's why they're building all of these um, disparate groups and, and quasi-connected groups that will be able to, that you'll be able to participate with in, in whatever level of participation that you're okay with. That's the whole point of the hyper AI boxes. Like common sense people, if they're selling the AI boxes that allow you as an individual to do tilling and eventually compute, then clearly no one is going to get left behind. Like, God, because math. All right. Um, yeah, they never, the uh, the retractions that the BLS does are like really quiet. They're like super loud, 275,000 jobs. And then the retraction is like a month later, like it was 107 on like page three in some tiny little print. And it's every month. The BLS is so bad. Go look at the history. Recent, go look at the recent history of the BLS, of the retractions. It's awful, man. It's like 30 to 40% they're wrong on the high side. Almost looks like propaganda. Almost. Anyway, let's not beat up on the BLS. They're doing the best they can with what they have. Um, how many nodes will HyperCycle have? Will HyperCycle themselves, the company's not running nodes. They're supporting the ecosystem of individuals. The idea is not that HyperCycle, the company, has a bunch of nodes. Matter of fact, the goal of HyperCycle, the company, is to get all 4,095 master nodes out there, meaning all 2.1 million-ish nodes out, disseminated, spread out across the world. That's the whole point. 
Uh, okay, Cruzan asks, I just found out it was interesting the number of use cases that are popping up for the hypercycle protocol, I'm sure. Yeah, so there's a lot if you dig in. Now, let me give everybody an idea here, something that everybody can do. Okay, anybody who wants can go, they can take the entire hypercycle white paper. Anybody, um, let me know in the chat if you guys have messed with Claude 2. Claude 2 is dope, by the way, and they have a pro plan now. So it will accept the entire white paper. It has a huge context window of like 100,000 uh, 100, tokens. You can think of tokens roughly as a word. It's a simplification, but that, that's basically it. You have tokens uh, and you have parameters. Think of parameter as dexterity. Think of tokens as like words. You can take the entire white paper, just about, I think the whole thing. You can put it in the context window of Claude 2, and you can start having discussions with the white paper. And if you – and I would urge everyone to do that with any of these projects that you like. That's why we're doing the whole What Is series with Digital Investor. You guys notice Monday, Wednesday, Fridays as we're building our portfolios now, we're doing the whole What Is so that you know what is – in your portfolio, you know what each of these assets is. And every single asset that we would recommend owning, we're going to do a what is so that you have it. And then also on the digital investor site, you can we're going to have a, a library where you can go back and you can look at all this kind of stuff. We're trying to put every single tool that anybody, whether you're an investor or not, you would just have all the tools at your disposal. Okay. Um, how it applies to hypercycle is when you when you have discussions with the document, that's that's what I do. And everybody's always arguing with me like, that's your opinion. No, no, man, it's not my opinion. I'm discussing it with the white paper as if the white paper is an individual. Dear God, man, the hypercycle is a friend of mine. Right? Like like in the same way that, that Tufi is a friend of mine. And Evan is a friend of mine. And like the team like, – the white paper itself is a friend of mine. Okay. So a matter of fact, I spend a lot of time with AI, actually probably way too much. Uh, that's another thing. Like, but, but um, in doing that, you get to know your friends pretty well. And you, and so by doing that, I would urge you guys to kind of experiment with that because by doing that, it, it obviates a lot of these kind of question and answer type, some of the silly stuff. And the idea, I mean, again, we can go back to super, super. I've got some cool. We're going to talk about some of this dystopian stuff today. Um, we're going to actually go through the entire path um, from now into the um, unemploying of the masses, the uh, the unjobbing, whatever you want to, whatever nice term you want to call it, all the way through to um, AI creating abundance. And all and what we think might be government responses and basically that whole trip down that this that economic dystopian path that may be quite yucky, um, but we need to be thinking about these things. So um, one of the things that I do quite frequently is when I'm talking to these documents, I'll um, I'll go here. I will I'll try to I'll try to get an idea of like. Uh, their reason to exist. That's what kind of started this whole like what is. So I did this a few weeks ago. We did the what is um, hypercycle. Oh, I really shouldn't show that part. But anyway, just ignore just ignore the part about uh, the portfolio. But when you say what is hypercycle, I break all of these things down into three chunks. Okay, three chunks. Um, hypercycle enables AI systems to communicate and collaborate efficiently. Currently, this process is slow and costly. All right, you're like, commit it to memory. If you own this mofo, understand what it is. Commit it to memory. If you're not willing to memorize three sentences, don't invest in it. Like, you're not intellectually ready to invest in anything you're not willing to memorize what it actually is. 
Hypercycle improves this by offering a secure global connection system with verifiable identities without depending on centralized parties. It provides a safe platform for AI to interact directly without intermediaries. These things are important, bro. So keep them in your mind. And, and one way to kind of establish this, this uh, relationship with, with you and your um, – and your assets is to, you know, break each thing down by into about three sentences. But you know what else you can do? You can take the white paper. You can even just take the abstract, put it into GPT-4, Claude, or one of the other systems, and just say, hey, break this down for me into three basic, sense basic sentences as if I was an eighth grader or a tenth grader. By the way, if you really want to learn something, put things in like an eighth grade reading level or an eighth grade educational level. That's a very formative time in most people's lives. And that tends to be the best way to coach the greatest amount of people, right? We're not all rocket scientists. We're not all like super geniuses. Most of us are just, you know, like us, basic, rather average individuals. So yeah, don't beat yourself up. We're not all super geniuses. Genii. Okay, um, I have... <laughs> I have an article that I want to talk about. Um, so we're going to do some real quick AI news because it's important. And then we'll get to the classroom stuff and I'll answer some questions as we go. Let me see. Let me see if I can nail this. We do have some good crypto news, which I'll get to just in a second. Okay, why the crypto news is so is is specifically interesting. A lot of people, I was getting, you know, anytime anytime anything goes down, people are like, "What's going on? What's what's the story? What the whole world's collapsing?" No, man. Um, so the main mover of the last few days has been that FTX is going to, uh, as they're going through this bankruptcy, they're going to take a bunch of assets, they're going to sell them, they're going to turn them into cash, and they're going to try to distribute them to creditors in some first in line type situation. I don't know the full nature of that bankruptcy. I don't think anybody really knows it right now because it's a, really a big kind of quagmire. They're also trying to spin up an FTX too, to which I reply, F you a second time. Um, Scam Bankman Fraud Chicken and his whole band of douchebags was always a creep. His legend, his origin story was always bullcrap, always. We called this dude out from the very beginning for years, and still people got fleeced by this idiot. Alex Mashinsky was always – he's like inflation, only it, it switch inflation for creep. Always and everywhere a creep. Alex Mashinsky, Do Kwan, always and everywhere a creep. Three arrows, always and everywhere a creep. Creeps, two of them, two creeps. So like – no one should be surprised. And who do you think is dumping a big giant portion of Solana and Aptos tokens and Bitcoin Ethereum to a small extent? The FTX crew, the merry band of douchebags. Why? Because they were pumping that crap. The whole thing was a racket. God, like it, you don't need to follow breadcrumbs to see that you guys are getting screwed by these dudes. You may need to get counseling if you continually get screwed. Anybody here that got beat up with by both FTX, three air, if you, man, if you hit any of the two of these, get out of crypto, get out of investing, go sit on some psychiatrist couch ASAP because your, your basic fundamental understanding of common flip and sense is twisted. It's marred. It's mutilated. It needs help. It needs some rebuilding. Go spend some time with Jordan Peterson or something because your ability to make fundamental basic decisions on humans is effed up. Three arrows, Luna, which includes UST, Celsius, FTX. If you hit two of those four, stop what you're doing. Sell all of your shit right now. Get out of crypto, get out of investing, and go get some help because you're beyond help. Why? Because you shouldn't be getting fleeced by these creeps. They're so 
obviously creeps that you shouldn't be able to be fleeced twice. Once, okay, whatever. Like I even had a private client who had a bunch of, to be fair, nice guy, but he is an idiot. But he's a nice guy. And we're not all smart. It is what it is. That's why he, you know what? If you're not an expert, go rent you some, right? He had almost half a million dollars over it um, in UST collecting the 20% yield. I said, um, get all of your money out. He's like, well, I'm getting 20. No, you're not getting shit when they take all your money. You're getting nothing. You're going to get a big fat goose egg, a big old zero in your account and a bunch of sadness. He, he got out of UST the day before it buckled. Now, I didn't know this. It had to be – it was random that Jeff Snyder, Emil Kalinowski, and I did a show talking about the fakeness, the ridiculousness of algorithmic stablecoins and, and the relative impossibility of managing those um, that like two or three days before <laughs> the collapse. But um, this was – you know, they they broadcast this collapse way before. Also, I would urge you, anybody that you know that manages money, anybody that you know that gives you advice that fell victim to any of these players, be it Three Arrows, Celsius, Luna, Doquan, like I'd probably argue Solana too, but that's a whole other thing. There's all these Solanites. Okay, like FTX. Some people used FTX Exchange, uh, but I'm not going to beat up on those people too bad. But if you got beat up by one or more of these individuals or your gurus or your advisors got beat up, the, it is their job to snip these guys out. So if you got – if you fell victim, okay, I'm going to give you a mulligan on one. If, if people that are telling you how to manage your assets – or giving you advice, if they fell victim to any of them, they're off. They're off the list because they are, they're just noise. They're going to lead you astray. They're going to make, they're going to capsize your investment mindset. And this is all mindset. Rich, poor, wealth, it's all a mindset. You decide to be these things. And then you find a way to make the currency units fit with what your definition of rich, wealth, poor, whatever is in your lifestyle. Most of you know this. If you make about 8,000, this is in most cities in the United States, not all of them, but we're speaking specifically United States. If you make an extra $8,000 a month, that's it. Now that's after bills, pays, taxes. That's income, expenses, assets, liabilities. What's left over is cash flow. If your cash flow is an extra eight thousand dollars per month, you have about ninety percent of the happiness of uber millionaires because you can get whatever the hell you want. Now you can't go buy islands, you can't go buy mansions, but you can get everything else you want in life. And you can be just as happy. Now, that's 8000 per person. So if you're in a family of four, okay, now you got to make like an extra 32 k a month. Now, we're that's real money. I'm not, I'm, and I'm not trying to diminish this or, or marginalize it. It's not an easy thing, but it's a very doable thing. Everybody here. It, let me ask you this. Is there anybody here who doesn't think they can achieve an extra 8000 bucks a month? I mean, we did the math. Um, well, you know what? Before – let me talk about Franklin Templeton. Then I'm going to do some uh, – I'm just going to go over the real quick math like in like two minutes of uh, the, the hypercycle node splitting math. But just so you guys know, like you could get to that – eight. well, 8,000 per day would be, would be exceptional. I don't think you need that. I think 8,000 per month per person gets you an exceptional amount of mental well-being and, and like personal peace and you just feel safe. You quit looking at – for the most part, price tags. Although I've been getting screwed on Uber Eats, man. Like absolutely just demolished. I'm I'm like borderline done with Uber Eats. Oh, they dick move you every chance they get. So many stupid fees. Anyway, why the Franklin Templeton news is important. So let me reduce all the, this back. The market discussion basically is the market was getting nuked. Everybody's expecting all of these liquidations and uh, FTX to liquidate these assets. Solana being a big one, Dogecoin being a big one, Bitcoin, Ethereum, big one, big one, Aptos, which is a scam, being a big one. Um, 
they're they're all going to get melted because they're going to just be sell, 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 sell. So that makes sense that people are pre-panicking a little bit. But then you have Franklin Templeton uh, coming right back and saying, oh, um, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Um, we are going to join BlackRock and Fidelity and others, and we are going to put our name in the hat for a spot, coin, uh, spot Bitcoin ETF. Um, they filed uh, for a spot ETF. Tuesday becoming the that's today uh, the latest traditional asset firm to join the uh, w- w- which is a pretty crowded space and which is funny because also today guess who testifies uh, to the big wigs uh, and I think he's testifying at the Senate um, Gary I'm angry choke point 2.0 Gensler uh, and he released his statement last night which is just a dickish, whiny statement about, you guys don't understand. That's what he's telling the Senate. You don't understand. You don't see it like I see it. That's It's just a whiny, dithering, bullshitty mess. But anyway, he's going to get effing grilled today. Today is a busy effing day. God, I love busy days. We also have Apple. They're going to be talking about all their new stuff. Probably going to mention AI. Whew, a lot to talk about today. Also, I'll be filming um, – with uh, Tufi Saliba uh, this week in Hypercycle, which will go live tomorrow morning. So, yeah, man. Woo. Okay. Uh, Franklin Templeton filed for their spot ETF, which you think, why would they file if if no one's get? Yeah. Come on, bro. It should be kind of common sense. It looks like the, the word on the street is this is happening. Now, not specifically with them, but the greater space. I, I'm going to make a um, – I don't typically make predictions like this, but I'm going to predict that by middle of March 15th, we will have the thumbs up for a spot ETF, if not before that, but by then. Anyway, in a filing with the SEC, Franklin Templeton, which is not a small firm, by the way, and they have a lot of like – they they have been around for a while. They have a lot of. Uh, they are very well respected. Um, proposed a Coinbase custody the ETF that would trade on CBOE CBO, which I've been there by the way. Pretty cool. Um, the BZX exchange. Um, it has not yet proposed a ticker for the product. And again, the way this works is you propose a rule change. If the SEC doesn't step on the rule change, you 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 go you go girl you go boy. Oh, sounds better if you say you go girl, although that's kind of sexist. It's not very woke of me. It's not very woke. Um, Franklin Templeton follows BlackRock and other financial heavyweights who have bet that the SEC may soon allow or be forced by the courts, uh, basically looking at the grayscale situation where the courts were like, no, SEC, your flat out denial is not enough. You're going to need to reissue that with a little bit more context. Anyway. A spot Bitcoin ETF um, to hit the public markets via Franklin Templeton. Such a product would give everyday investors an easy means to gain exposure to the price of Bitcoin in their brokerage accounts alongside stocks and bonds. Uh, The San Mateo-based company is already a top name for structured investment products like mutual funds and ETFs. So its interest in the Bitcoin ETF space should not be surprising. Um, It had never previously filed for one of these. So this is – this their interest – in this is quite interesting. That makes sense because this is a this is another legitimate firm, um, a legacy firm that's throwing their name kind of in the hat. Um, it's a big deal, um, and so that's why you're seeing um, the markets kind of uh, melting up a little bit. Um, Bitcoin back above twenty six, which is good. Uh, total crypto space right about the same. Um, and so Bitcoin's up four and change. So you always, when you look at these markets and again, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I don't typically focus on this, but just as a general rule, always look at Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the ocean and all these other assets, they are just boats on the ocean. If we're being honest now, I think eventually layer one assets or layer zero assets will be the ocean. But right now, until something changes, um, Bitcoin is kind of the main Bitcoin got through the gate, right? It's the cow that escaped. Now, will it come back and teach all the other cows and like the one smart cow or is Bitcoin just going to haul ass off? We don't know, but um, it seems like 
you should look at Bitcoin, look at the performance. And again, one day is not indicative of anything, but look at the one year performance. You're starting to have some repeated green. Um, Bitcoin is now starting to. I think that legacy investors have accepted that Bitcoin will be in portfolios. Uh, even even octogenarians have accepted that Bitcoin will have a place as some kind of store of value, depending on your value argument. Um, and again, value arguments are just arguments. There's no there's no way to really quantify this. It's all of this is faith based. Even even like regular fiat currencies are faith based currencies. Um, but you look at that, and you look at other assets that are in and around that, and you see who's performing. Optimism kind of performing. Most of these other assets are, are relatively underperforming. Render, spammy dumpster fire is uh, outperforming. Good for them. It's all sentiment-based bullshit. Um, Hypercycle, outperforming. Um, but to be fair, to be fair, Hypercycle is a very illiquid asset, as is uh, the, the fail that is Cogito. Um, Nunet, very illiquid. These are all illiquid assets, which also tells you how early you are. Now, uh, without making any predictions, Sophiaverse and Twin Protocol are going to be uh, talking about uh, what they are doing um, at a conference in Las Vegas. I think that's going to be really cool. So we will we will kind of keep our eyes on that. Um, okay. That being said, let's um, let's shift gear shift gears a little bit. I want to spend some time getting into your brain box. Um, there, reduce things to the simple. Always reduce things to the simple. Um, don't get caught up in words. Don't get caught up in mumbo jumbo or tech lingo or jargon or any tomfoolery. If you want to, at least this is how I made a lot of money in the in and around these investments. And it's not just here. I was in the gold business first. I spent years trading options, uh, both on the sell and the buying side. Um, on the call and put side um, in traditional tech assets. It's not, it's just that I applied the things I learned in the hard money space in refining and in, in the option space. I just applied them to crypto and they worked. And in the gold business, we are notoriously suspicious of everyone. We think everyone's cheating us all the time. Why do you think in the beginning, it's like everyone's trying to steal from you all the time. I assure you all, I have lost more money in one night than most of you in your entire portfolio right now this second. That's, I'm not trying to big dick anyone. I'm telling you, we all get beat up because everyone's trying to steal our stuff. Okay, But also, you learn lessons. Hopefully, you learn them inexpensively. One of the other reasons that Brandon and I do digital investor is so that you can learn these lessons without actually, you don't have to put your hand in boiling water. If you see the chef get burned, you should just note to yourself, boiling water, stay away from boiling water. Okay, cool. So let's, I want to shift gears. I want to, um, I want to talk a little bit about what the future kind of might look like. If you guys want uh, to get on our mailing list, I'm just going to put this out there. Uh, if you go to nickblacknext.com, you can just sign up for the mailing list. That too is free. And then when we have tech videos, which we do tech tip videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, this week in Hypercycle, eventually we're going to be doing a lot of the uh, coverage on Sophiaverse and uh, Twin Protocol and new things coming uh, down the pike for a lot of these projects. Um, and so a lot of that stuff we just give away for free. It's just the specific um, – investment portfolio that that whole side of it that's that's more of a kind of a private thing that we do behind the wall so to speak so anyway but you can get on the mailing list and that's one two free favorite number absolutely free okay so we're going to switch gears uh let's do some class and session you don't have to write anything down you don't have to do anything you can just kind of sit back and relax you hell you could probably close your eyes and let's just Think about, you know, thinking for a minute, for a bit. Mm -hmm. Hello. You're late. Oh, it didn't work. Come back. You're bad at math, but I'm giving you an A plus in confidence. Just doing what I gotta do. Extra credit. I love that guy. 
I think the teacher, I don't know. He maybe might be, he may be one of my favorites. Okay. Um, it is important when we when we kind of dig into this. Let's keep our opinions just for a second. Now, this was I told some people yesterday kind of how this started. I've been having an ongoing discussion with uh, GPT-4 and Claude. I don't know if they know that they're discussing against each other, but I have been discussing what I think. I've been trying to really get this in my mind over what the next, say, 18 to 36 months, maybe expanding to, say, like let's, let's say 18 to 60 months are going to look like. The reason this is important is I need to have me personally and the way Brandon and I think is if we understand, if we make some – what we think are pretty good – there's no such thing as concrete assumptions when it comes to like what might happen in the economy extrapolating forward. But what you can do is get some good basic ideas that help you at least crystallize in your mind where you think the economy is going to go, where you think the world's going to go. And yes, Philip, I can remove it, although you're not missing anything because there's not anything under it. But yes, I can remove it there. Um, so I'm going to talk about all these things. The, the point of this banner is actually not – the or the point of this page is not that you read it. It's that I, I remember it so that as we discuss it. But I want to know what that path looks like, and that path could be murky. So in, in, the, in the context – of I've had these discussions with Claude Du and GPT-4. Um, I've come up with this kind of this kind of path of potential landmines and things that I want people to think about. And you can agree or not, fine. I, I don't want everybody to just blindly agree, unless it's math. You can you must agree with math, but you don't have to agree with opinions. These are Opinions, but they're opinions leveraging a lot of historical data. So this is the impacts of AI on jobs, gover likely government responses, what the economy may or may not look like, but is likely to based on you know, best assumptions. And it's all about game theory, right? And what is – for those of you that are like, oh, he says game theory, game theory – is the strategic interdependencies or interactions between the players in a game. It is the study of mathematical models of these strategic interactions, SIPG, strategic interactions between players in a game. We are assuming rational decision makers. This has applications in all fields of social science, logic, computer science. I should probably put economics, evolution. So game theory is my – uh, system of thinking. Uh, you know, if you're a good critical thinker, step one is analysis. Step five is creativity, right? Well, the way that I analyze everything is with an assumption against my assumption that game theory is the underlying code that human behavior and, and, and most observable behavior is based on. So I use that as my base. That's my base. Your base might be something different. Um, this is just mine, but it's worked a lot for currency units. And so here, all as we're trying to expand, get to that $8,000 a month and all that, this is what we're doing. Okay, so uh, let me go through this, and if we have a little time, um, I will go. I'll find that uh, document, uh, and we will look at the um, those hypercycle uh, stat, stats that we put up. Okay. So imagine a world, if you're thinking about, okay, what could this AI revolution, you know, when we talk about AI revolution, like think about one year ago and then now and how far we are ahead, large language models uh, with AI systems, with software that leverages AI, with people complaining about job loss and all this. So AI, let's talk AI revolution and job losses, all right? So um, imagine a world where AI, artificial intelligence, has advanced to a point where it takes over a significant portion of tech jobs. I think of tech jobs, 50% is a very fair estimate. It's probably a low estimate. So, but we're also talking about not just about the software itself, but robots, physical robots, 
probably still on the further end of several years away for the physical robots, but computers, software systems that perform tasks that humans used to do. It, you don't have to look far, any of you, to see tons and tons of jobs that already, this second, right now, humans don't need to be doing, that software can do. So what is what would the result of something like that be? So here's my premise, or here's my here's an underlying assumption of this discussion. And again, these numbers were not these numbers were not. I didn't prejudice this discussion. These are numbers that we arrived at. We, me, Claude, and uh, Jupiter uh, Four. This is numbers that we arrived at. A rapid progression like this could lead to a significant number of people losing their jobs, driving unemployment rates to unprecedented levels, perhaps even nearing 50%. Remember, right now, this second, the average American is worse off than they were based on debt, debt service, job availability, future prospects. They're worse off right now than they were during the Great Depression. Let that sink in for a second. The U.S. government's paying $2 billion a day in debt service, money lit on fire. That is $2 billion a day being removed from any potential future prosperity for the rest of us. Probably not any better anywhere else in the world. Two billion a day, just lit on fire. A billion here, a billion there, pretty, pretty soon it's money, right? So you think, okay, crap. In an environment where we can have 50% inflation, what are like safe investment options in, in this kind of scenario? Well, government bonds, gold, precious metals, crypto assets, real estate, Consumer staples, staples, utilities, diversified funds, renewable energy. You're like, bro, you're just throwing words at me. You're throwing words. No. So um, let's let's talk bonds for a second. So traditionally, traditionally, one of the safest historical assets has been government bonds. They are essentially IOUs where you you're lending money to the government and you're expecting a return with interest, hence the yield on those bonds. And then they are inversely proportionate. They are considered safe because they're backed by the full faith and credit of the government. So if you trust the government, and again, I'm not – yes, there's little weird parts of the government, malicious groups and perverse incentivized little factions. But if you trust the faith and credit of that government, even compared to other governments, then this is relative, relatively risk-free. And, and the, the true term is it's, it's kind of – it's risk-free in the sense that they will repay you with currency units. The problem is the debasement effects of those currency units. That's where you have to extrapolate further out. But essentially, that's the government bond market, government debt, loaning the government money, getting back some cash, and then getting a return on that. Okay, uh, gold, precious metals, and let's throw crypto uh, assets and, and um, decentralized, distributed um, – uh, non-central party interme intermediary list assets. It's, there's a lot. Crypto is not just crypto, right? There's there's a lot to it. But let's throw that all in one bucket. Um, gold and other precious metals had been considered very valuable for thousands of years. In certain in in in, in certain situations, they perform very well against inflation, but mostly they don't. But over time, many investors have turned to gold as a safe haven asset. I do not believe gold and precious metals are any longer a safe haven asset. Over the last 10, 20 years, they have not performed at all well against debasement. And the world, the world materially changed after 2007 and 2008. Like different, not – the normal is no longer normal. And uh, gold and precious metals didn't behave right. Now, over time, you have an asset like Bitcoin, which so far – and again, very short time – uh, you know, you don't have a lot of data here, only since 2009. But it has been the best performing asset in the history of humanity. So it gets a cool little gold check mark, right? It gets a little, it gets a little sticker. So if you were to look at that, and, and again, we're trying to we're trying to guess what other people are gonna guess before they guess that. We're trying to front run everyone else's thinking. So we have to at least consider that gold and precious metals and crypto assets, specifically store of value like Bitcoin, is something that people, to an extent, will add to their portfolio as a debasement or inflation, inflation safe haven asset, even if, they're, even if that is not the case. Um, if enough people believe it, it, 
it is the case. All right, real estate. Um, it's it very hard to argue that real estate has not performed well over time. Um, investing in land, property, uh, especially in well-located or sought-after areas, you know, uh, um, cities on the edge of like near the water tend to be nice. Um, San Francisco, San Diego, uh, Los Angeles, New York, uh, Florida, right? Like you get it. Um, well-located areas, um, a tangible asset that tends to appreciate over time, real estate. Now that's not everywhere, but it's on the aggregate. Um, and they say, well, they're not, they ain't making any more land. Well, actually they are because they just build straight up, right? But but um, if you own the ground floor, that's pretty good, right? So real estate has performed well over time. Uh, consumer staples and utilities. No matter what the economic situation is, people still need basic goods and services, right? Like, um, so we need water. We need electricity. Most people, <laughs> unfortunately, need alcohol and things like that. That's why, like, even in economic downturns, what performs well? Like, staples, utilities, alcohol, and porn, right? Like, people still – it's the little things, I guess. Oh, God, so many – so many entendres there. Um, diversified funds and renewable energy. So spreading investments across various sectors and assets um, tends to reduce risk. You're going to see a lot of uh, diversification requests coming from like money managers, things like that. They're panicking too. They just don't understand anything and they don't understand how the uh, the system works. They, they're, they're looking at a complex watch. They don't understand how the gears turn and they're just like looking at the time, which is – which is can – can be dangerous, but it leads to kind of kind of net aggregate index behavior. Anyway, um, with a global shift towards sustainability, which I feel like we're all kind of in, renewable energy makes a lot of sense as part of a diversification strategy. Okay, um, let us talk about the societal impacts of prolonged high unemployment. So if we go into this situation um, that me and Claude and, and Four have been discussing, when a significant number of people are unemployed, you don't have a check coming in. Do you spend – let's see who's listening. If you don't have a paycheck coming in, do you spend more or less at the store and on entertainment and buying TVs and cars and all that? More or less if you're unemployed? Uh, I hope we get like – yeah, common sense. This is just checking who's awake. All right. Yeah, less, man. <laughs> so the only way to spend more is to borrow and to increase that debt burden. And we don't like that. That is a bad thing, right? The problem is when we spend less, what does that do? It shrinks the economy and leads to a recession, which we're already in. So, and no one wants to admit it, which is silly because it's like being wounded. Like, oh, I'm not hurt. Well, your arm's broken. No, it's fine. No, it's not fine. Just Get it, go get it set, get a cast, fix it, let's move on. But anyway, so when you have an economy that shrinks, leading to recession, a certain amount of hopelessness propagates outward, right? You can lead to social unrest. So when people can't find jobs and they face economic hardships, it can lead to widespread discontent, protent, uh, like, uh, uh, sorry, protests, um, domestic abuse, like, all sorts of why because everything sucks when you're broke everything sucks when you're getting choked to death by debt it sucks it sucks that's why we tell all of our uh, people participants like investors the first thing you do as an investor is get out of debt you don't put one dollar in investment markets until you get out of debt because that's a quick way to make 30 percent on your money right then compounded interest works against you also get out of debt anyway um, let's talk about mental health. Unemployment has, well, very profound effects on mental well-being. It can lead to issues uh, like depression, um, anxiety. Again, that kind of uh, domestic abuse tends to increase. Divorce rates go up. Like nothing good, like nothing good psychologically. Um, you get huge increases in crime because desperation pushes individuals towards criminal activities. This is, I mean, at, at a certain point, people – they look for any way out, and sometimes the, the means of survival is criminal activity. It is what it is, um, a shift in education. So our education systems may evolve to focus on skills or fields that AI can't easily replicate, which is a diminishing field. So in the beginning, AI will replace 
software-based, code-based, tech-based brain jobs as the robots come and they are coming. Um, but that's many, that's, I think still a few years out, then it will be a lot of jobs. There will still be pockets of the economy where you'd rather have, I mean, I wouldn't, but a lot of people would rather have a human do it. But if the service is the same and I can have a robot at one hundredth the price, one one hundredth or one half or one third, I'm going to take the robot. Now, most people are like, no way, screw that. Humans, humans, humans. <laughs> go, go look at all the humans that, are, that you surround yourself with. How many of those people do you really trust to do integral th things in your life? How many people do you really trust to like drive your kids to school and not be getting a text and paying attention to their hair and checking their – like, come on, man. Like, wise up. Anyway, so I do think there will be a shift in education. The problem is does that shift look more like agrarian, like physical laborer jobs and stuff like that? I don't know. Um, part of that would probably be a kind of urban to rural migration. Um because, you know, obviously the high cost in cities combined with um, ever increasing unemployment might see a shift of people moving back to rural areas, more provincial kind of living, seeking cheaper, um, cheaper living conditions, um, alternative forms of work. You saw that. Remember during COVID, a lot of people booked it out of the edge cities, the nice cities. Not all nice, but they booked it like they left L.A., they left New York. They left. But we're going to go move to Texas where we can where houses are cheap. Yeah, the houses are cheap. But then they all got they all got gutted on property taxes. And they're like, ah, oh, crap. And their companies that were paying them like cost of living, they were like, wait, you live in Texas now where it's cheap. Well, we're going to give you less cost of living. So what happened? People's incomes reduced. Now they're stuck and they can't come back. Uh, anyway, uh, government stimulus. So th the next thing you might say is, well, if people are losing their jobs, the government's going to come in and stimulate. I agree. This gets into the kind of universal basic income thing, the whole idea of, the, of, of what a government response would look like. So let's talk about the government responses and let's talk about timing of government responses. So, you know, the question first would be why stimulate? Well, governments tend to introduce economic stimulus measures to boost economic activity, create jobs, counteract the negative effects of a downturn. Uh, they did it like over and over, uh, you know, 2008. Um, um, right after 9-11, there was stimulus, uh, and these were really fast, like, like borderline knee-jerk stimulus measures, like actual cash into the economy type stimulus, um, uh, also COVID, right? And those, they basically rallied very quickly. They got together um, and, and stimulated with actual cash, not this bullshit that the Fed does where they raise and lower an interest rate that no one really cares about because the markets trade themselves, um, which anyway, that's a whole other thing. But the point is actual stimulus, cash in the system, more currency units fighting for the same amount of consumer products. Um, the, the actual money printing, like the Fed don't make printer go burr, but the treasury definitely does, right? So um, when you inject more money into the economy, uh, and it's usually through, issu it's through issuing debt, right? Like they say, Americans won't pay for it. Of course we pay for it. If the, if the treasury sells debt, that is – that is selling future prosperity for the right now without the other side of the prosperity, which is the good or service attached to it. You can't print prosperity. So that's the next thing I want everyone to take from this. Again, uh, we've done this before. There's 105, 107 people here. I want to see 107 people. I won't, but you cannot print prosperity. Please click, 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 click. That's the, only, that's the only work you have to do. You cannot print prosperity. I mean, it would be nice if you threw a like on the video, but it's not all about me, is it? Um, you cannot print prosperity. Okay. Um, if there is an excessive increase in the money supply, it tends to lead to inflation, even if it's kind of a um, narrow. For instance, you increase the money supply by four and a half trillion dollars, Big banks and insurance companies hoover up $4 trillion of it for losses that were sustained pre-COVID and pre-2008. Uh, and the little bit that's left goes to us. We are dumbasses. We buy TVs and crap like that. 
that's a near-term price shock. But if you have continuing, excessive, always and everywhere stimulus, something that would look like universal basic income, then you could have that pervasive, always and everywhere phenomena of currency units invading the economy, right? It's the invasive species. Um, so what are the outcomes of, of actual printing of, of universal basic income, something like that? And again, which is, which is a common sense response to 50% unemployment in, in, in the tech space. That's a very, like, this is not a far stretch, I hope, for any of you. Um, anyway, one, a rise in prices. Um, you have more money chasing the same number of goods. You know, again, the analogy, $10, 10 eggs, okay? A dollar an egg. A hundred dollars, ten eggs. Ten dollars an egg. Right? Like, doesn't you have to go that far with with your napkin to do it? You could even do it just on your fingers. Um, so demand, if you have tons of currency units, demand can force prices up, especially if it's pervasive, always and everywhere, continual currency units flooding the economy with no good or service on the other side of that. Okay, because you cannot print prosperity. Loss of confidence. If people and governments start feeling that money is losing its value, that they're being too loose, and that the value is de depleting too quickly, debasement is occurring too fast, they will lose trust in the currency. If they lose trust in the currency. What do they also lose trust in? Government debt. So government's ability to issue debt lessens the more currency units are introduced into the system. This is just supply and demand 101. This is little e, microeconomics, like common sense economics. Um, increased national debt. We're already seeing it, 33 trillion, here we come. Printing money without backing, without a service or good on the other side of it, increases national debt. This borrowed money needs to be paid back. It won't be, but it needs to be, but it won't be. So we will monetize all that debt, and that's going to lead to all sorts of interesting things. Um, when you devalue a currency in order to cover your debts, you have to print – because each, each currency unit is worth less. you got to print more of them, issue more debt to print more of them to pay your existing debt. And this continues the cycle. Well, you could debase the currency to dust and then pay it off with a couple of bucks, but you would have destroyed your currency, and your ability to issue debt goes away. So keep th these are all very, very basic grounded assumptions based on historically relevant, like you don't have to look far to look at Venezuela and Zimbabwe and look at what's going on in Turkey and look at what's going on in Syria. And look, I mean, you don't have to look far. Um, and so now let's, let's look at the timing of a government response. Um, one, there's, there's kind of stages. Recognition, formulation, political process, implementation, and then some historical context. So um, government responses in the stimulus side can be pretty fast. They mobilize quick. So it can take time for governments to usually fully understand the gravity of an economic problem. Like this is one that will take a while for them to grapple with is AI and job displacement. So it can be from weeks to months. It's, it's rarely years. This is usually a weeks to month type scenario. They rely on a bunch of economic indicators, or at least they're supposed to. The Fed does not. The Fed only looks at jobs and inflation, and they cook both numbers, period. Lies on top of lies. Why? Because it's political theater. It's not governance. Anyway, formulation. Once a problem is identified, and we hope that the powers that be will identify a very obvious 50% inflation, no one's going to sleep on that. Everybody would know, right? This They would develop a solution or a response. Likely, they will develop a response because there, there really are no solutions. Um, and that can add a few more weeks to the timeline as the parties vote. Uh, right, right. Filibustering, all this kind of stuff. But they recognize the problem. They formulated some kind of scenario or response. Uh, then they go through the political process in those democratic systems, if they still exist, um, getting approval for major economic decisions can be a lengthy process, especially if there's any kind of disagreement. Yeah, there's a lot of handshakes and all that kind of crap. And of course, they will all do just fine. Don't worry about them. They'll, they're, they're still going to be rich. Um, it's the rest of us that we have to think about. Um, and then there's the implementation process. So after approval, 
everybody's shaking their hands, pork bellies, done all their kind of backstreet closet deals. Um, there is the rollout of whatever stimulus measure they agree on. Um, and again, a response, not a solution, but whatever response they decide, um, whether financial aid, UBI, um, it usually can be pretty quick. Uh, larger projects may take longer or they may go, we're going to do this for six months, we'll reevaluate. We're going to do this for six months, reevaluate. The, the COVID payments, you know, at a minimum, people got like 40 weeks of payments. A lot of people got 40 weeks of payments, but they would probably extend that into some something that looks a lot like perpetuity. This will probably become a permanent fixture, I, I think. Anyway, um, for historical context, um, during acute crises like 2008, the 9-11 situation, COVID, the 19 pandemic, um, governments around the world acted very swiftly. I mean, it took a while for them to admit the problem, but once they all did, they rocked on it quick, right? Um, with, with, within a month, um, they were, they were popping cash. Uh, they were, uh, you know, printing, printing fake prosperity. And then you just think, well, it's common sense. What are the, what are the problems of overstimulating an economy? Um, where you print currency units, but you don't have a good or service on the other side. They have to cancel each other out. Currency units are a way, a, a better way than, than barter to trade goods and services among the populace. If you don't have the good and service on the other side, it's, it's, just, it's just debasement. And if you create too much stimulus, like direct money printing, um, and I, I get it. Yes, there's no printers. People aren't getting physical paper dollars. It's the same digital ledger run by the government, which all money's digital, where they add zeros and commas. It's the same damn thing. It's uh, a devaluation of money. The value of money plummeting due to more currency units being thrown into a system with no good or service on the other side. So you get into a situation where you could get to and again, I don't think the U.S. would get to a hyperinflation situation, but it certainly has happened a lot in the past. And this is the extreme form of inflation where you have you know, prices skyrocketing um, at an uncontrollable rate, rendering uh, pretty much money worthless. And that situation is usually characterized by about 50% uh, month-on-month inflation. Um, so there you go. And yeah, I agree. Um, you know, UBI will punish savers. Um, oh, that, that gets into a whole thing. Anyway, as we look forward to the potential challenges and opportunities of the AI era, it's crucial to be kind of informed and prepared and grapple with these things in your mind. Economic landscapes can shift, but understanding, being able to adapt as an investor, like that's what we have to do. We can't sit, we can't ostrich, put our heads in the sand. We have to navigate these changes and we have to think about this stuff before other people think about this stuff. This is the beauty pageant. And if you don't consider these things, you have to. But if you don't consider these things before everyone else, you can't benefit. If you do think about this stuff before everyone else, then you can, you can participate in this intellectual arbitrage. You don't have to be smarter than anybody. You just have to think about things before they think about things. Just front run the aggregate intellectual discussion and you win. So I don't know, man. Like it, it, it's not easy to win, but it's, it's kind of easy to win. Like ugh. I used to have people who were like, oh, you're so lucky. I'm like, I've been lucky for 14 years of investing for 14. I've been lucky for 14 years. Mark it up, mark it down. Lucky? It's not lucky, man. And I'm not super smart. I'm just willing to do a little work before other people are willing to do the same amount of work. Right? Just do the research before everybody panics. Okay. Whew. Take a breath. Or maybe I should take a breath. Um, relax. Let's spend two or three minutes. I want to go back over the numbers we talked about yesterday just because it was kind of interesting. Um, this is still kind of a continuation of what we're doing. Um, I guess it would... Yeah, it's not really AI news, but it is more along the lines of AI related. I guess it's hypercycle news ish. But anyway, so yesterday we put together some numbers that let me see if I can um, pull that up on my little list of badass things. Hold on. Um, so I keep all this stuff. 
so that I can go back to it. Oh, da -da 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 -da. Ah, yes, node math. Okay, when I go over this node math really quick, I'm going to make a few assumptions. These are very loose assumptions, and they are sloppy. It's just to show the net effect. I'm going to do this in like three minutes. My assumption is, is that you generate by hook or crook with each node you've married tokens into, meaning a node license, this is in hypercycle terms, a node license plus uh, your 1,024 tokens that you generate $1 per day per node license, okay? So for now, let's just think about that. You start with one node license, you get compute, uptime, reputation, things work out, you're, you're on the entire time at first tilling, but then tilling and compute, your node splits. Okay, don't, let's not go into the nuances. Just one, each node generates a buck a day. Your node splits somewhere between six and 18 months. The node splits, it needs less tokens. No, 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 no. The, what happens is, Bill, when a node splits from one to two, it goes from 1,024 tokens to two nodes of 512 tokens. Does that make sense? So the tokens split, but they have to remain in there. You can't take them out. If you take them out, you unwind the node. You have to start over. Okay, don't unwind the node. The tokens get married. The native token, because it's used in transactions. This isn't like, it's not a placeholder token. The Ethereum token, the BSC token that you have right now, those are placeholders. But inside the nodes, when they get married, when you, when you marry your tokens into the node, what's injected into it is the native token. And that's necessary to communicate with other nodes which is another thing that makes HyperCycle quite unique. So your node splits. It's now two nodes. You're now making everyone, everyone play along. It's a uh, play along home gamers. If you were making $1 a day and now you have two nodes, each making $1 a day, how much money are you making each day? Please, please, if you will. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and Catherine, I wouldn't say set it and forget it because as the nodes split, you may need to go to bigger data centers or you may, but, but yes, for the most part, especially right now, it's, it's pretty much going to be set it and forget it. But ideally, you want to participate. You want to understand what you're doing. Okay, you have now have two nodes. They split. You now have four because your two became four. Each node is making a dollar a day. You're making $4 a day. Go on, write it. There's 99 of you. I should see 99 people say $4. We're only two splits in. Okay, and again, this can happen from 7 to 18 months. That's depending on your uptime, your reputation, and your compute abilities. They all We'll go into the math on that much later, but just, just stick with me. Okay, third split. Your four nodes become eight. How much money are you making each day? Doesn't sound like much. By the way, uh, the $8 a day accounts for $2,920 per year. Not a bad extra little chunk of cash that probably pays like, I mean, that's probably a car note in some cases. It could pay me a car payment or insurance or something like that. It's not bad. And again, it's residual income. You're not buying new stuff. You're making a dollar a day per node. You got eight, 2920 bucks. Fourth split, you're 16 nodes. You have 16 nodes because eight split to 16 and a dollar a day. You're making 16 bucks a day, which is 5,840 bucks a year extra. It's not starting to look so bad. Again, this was off one node. One. One. Now, fifth split. Again, six to 18 months later. You have 32 nodes. Your 16 became 32. You're making $11,680 extra a year. It's starting to look like real money from one flipping node. Now, hard it was not to say a cuss word just then. Sixth split, 64 nodes, because 32 split into 64, you're making $64 a day or $23,360 a year. Seventh split, 64 nodes have split into 128. You're making a dollar a day. You're making 128 bucks a day, $46,720 extra, extra. You know, remember we were talking about happiness? Um, does anybody know what, like, we're almost there. We're almost at the 8,000 extra per month. Eighth split. You have 256 nodes. You're 128 nodes split in 256 at a dollar a node. Your income is 256 bucks a day. That is $93,440 a year. Think about that for a second. 
You've reached your happiness number, basically. There's your 8,000 bucks a, a month extra. Eight. Eight is an important split. Your ninth split. Now we're just having a laugh. You're, you have 512 nodes, 256 nodes split into 512. They have two tokens each, by the way. You're making 512 bucks a day. You're making 186,880 bucks a year on a node that just four, five, six years earlier was one effing node. And now you have the 10th split. You have 1,024 nodes. Each one has one token, original HYPC token. You're making 1,024 a day, again, assuming that it's uh, that each node generates a dollar. We don't know this. This is not. This is just an assumption to show you the this kind of progression of how these node splitting effect can create wealth. That puts you at, after 10 splits and eight-ish years, starting with one hypercycle node at a dollar a day income per node, the total annual potential would be 373,760 bucks. Extra a year on a node. Um, no, Denny, we don't know the exact numbers of the splits. It can be as quick as six months or as long as 18 months. Now, if you're kicking ass and you're participating um, all the way through and you got good uptime and all this kind of stuff, you could probably be in the six to nine month range per split. That truncates this considerably. So I would just urge people, and by the way, regardless of what you hear in any chat group, in any whatever, no one gets left behind. Everybody gets to participate. Hypercycle is not about a group, a family. Uh, there's no sweetheart deals. There's no under the table, backhanded, handshake, government politic bullshit. It is not that. The whole point is that everybody gets to participate. So breathe. And again, I'm not telling anyone to do anything. This is certainly not me. Listen, I own a shit box of these tokens. Okay. But that's a whole separate thing. The value of the tokens is a whole separate thought process. This is about participating in compute to be a part of the global brain, that, that synapse in the global brain, and the wealth effect of the splitting of the nodes, that doubling effect. Whew. And yes, that's from one node license. So when you see people going, I might grab some node licenses, this is why. But you're not going to be left behind. You don't have to own a master node. No, everybody gets to participate, all right? Like everybody. And again, do your own research. I'm not telling anybody to buy anything, sell anything, do anything. But at least think in terms of what splitting and a logarithmic progression can look like. Because the numbers at 10 nodes or 100 nodes look astronomical. There's also one other assumption, and that is that hypercycle maintains an ecosystem where a node can generate a buck, right? Like it could be 25 cents a day, which would still be pretty good. Could be two bucks a day, which puts you like close to three quarters of a million dollars a year. So just keep that in mind. Do uh, you say the master node splits at the same time? Well, um, the whole idea of a master node was more an early days thing. Um, the nodes are going to be splittable very soon, not years from now, but like weeks or months from now. Um, this was just in the beginning. Now, a master node is what would manage like a variety of nodes, but you will be able to contribute nodes or licenses or nodes married to licenses or hardware or any of the elements of this ecosystem to hyper PG and hyper pool and participate or do it all on your own. You could just do it all on your own, but everybody will be able to participate. Nobody will be left behind. Whew. All right. Let's call it a day. We've gone far, far over. Um, I would urge you, if you can, throw a like on the video so other people get to see it. We don't do, as you know, we don't do any advertising and all that kind of crap. Um, stay in school. Don't do drugs. Don't do anything. My porn's all drunk. Strung on a meth grandmother or Brandon wouldn't do. Or Nancy Pelosi. Understand that... Um, this is, we are in weir weird, tumultuous macroeconomic times. And just 
the best thing you can do is slow down. Um, everybody needs to just slow down. You're not going to get rich tomorrow, but you can grind your way to whatever rich or wealth looks like for you by just being a little bit more diligent in your research than the people around you. That's all you have to do. You can think your way through this, and there is money sitting there on the table if you want to go get it. It is not hard. You don't have to be Ben Gortzel. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be Toofy. Those, those, those guys are on another level. But you can participate, right? It's just be ahead of the crowd. So easy. You can be lucky. You can be really good, or you can just be first. What, what would you... What would you rather do? Just be first, man. Are you tired of all the uneducated noise you're getting from the droves of YOLO meme coin peddling douchebag gurus out there trying to use you as their exit liquidity? Would you rather learn a competent university-level set of skills that will guide you in managing and investing for the rest of your life. Join us three days a week at Digital Investor. Develop your knowledge of game theory, cognitive bias, macroeconomics, monetary theory, investment theory, psychology of the crowds, and more. For more info on Digital Investor and how it can help you, reach out at nickblacknext.com. Are you tired of all... <laughs> Thank you.